Thank you very much. Um, well, okay, is this going to go to me? Where are? Oh. <laughs> That's a good start. Um, practical ideas for a happier world. Um, you know, can we do extraordinary things? Um, the problems of the world often seem very large, and we seem very small. And um, whilst I haven't suffered from depression like that woman, I often have days when I feel very depressed and grumpy, and maybe that's my age and whatever. But, uh, but basically, you know, how, how can we act in this, in this slightly crazy world? And I, you know, I want to sort of, sort of share some ideas around that and some of the work we've been doing at NEF um, over the last decade now, actually. So this was me at TED, which Mark just showed. And um, TED's an extraordinary thing because you're giving a talk and you really, you're giving a talk live, but you're also giving a talk to a video. And I did a very shameless thing, which was that I quoted this man, Martin Luther King. And I think um, you, you can only, you reach for Luther King when you want to go for universals. Uh, you know, there's not many people that everyone can go, there's a good man with no <laughs> problems. So you, you sometimes reach them, probably Gandhi, Mandela, a few others, and, um, and of course he says a very positive thing when he says, I have a dream. Um, but what, he, what probably people know less, I'm sure probably most of this audience knows, is actually that sentence starts with this, which is that even though we face difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. His was not some sort of optimism which was nothing to do with the sort of real world. He was obviously working in a hugely stressful situation, the civil rights movement. I think something beyond the imagination of all of us in this room to actually have known what it was like to live as an oppressed colored person in the States in the 1940s and 50s. And their struggle was absolutely extraordinary. We obviously are in different times, but we too face difficulties of today and tomorrow. Um, you know, the state of the nation at the moment, you know, we have record levels of unemployment, people sitting around not fulfilling their potential. We had the London riots this summer. Um, and we have things like, you know, um, a lot of people feeling most unhappy around the financial system, the Occupy movement. I think it's actually the Indianago from Spain, this picture. But actually, there's a lot of feeling that actually things are not great uh, whatever, and okay, our economic indicators also don't say it's great at the moment, but there's a feeling that actually life is not really moving in the right direction. Um, this is a graph of income inequality in the UK from 1979 when uh, the good lady who the film is just out about at the moment came to power. Uh, and we can see that basically we've had a, we've had a rising income inequality in the UK uh, quite dramatically over that period. That's um, uh, actually, I haven't got the graph here, but if you went right back to the 1930s, you know, you said we, saw, we saw income inequality improving and we've actually lost some of those gains. And what's extraordinary about this change in income inequality is where it's happened in the, in the income distribution. This is deciles, groups of 10% of the population. And basically you can see that the middle 80% of people had their real wages rise about roughly the same in that period. But the top 10% had them rise much higher, and the bottom 10% saw their real incomes fall. And that's where we're getting this really, really sharp rise in inequality, as it's the extreme at the top and the extreme at the bottom that's going on. And I think this is very worrisome for our society. Obviously, Richard Wilkinson and people who've done stuff on like the spirit level have talked about this a lot, but it seems to be troubling. Obviously, there's not only income inequality within our country. We've got global inequality. This is a graph of uh, income around the whole world. And um, you can see the line at the bottom saying the poorest 10%, and then the poorest 50% of the population. 50, you know, a lot of people are living under $2 a day, $1 a day. If everybody had the same amount of money in the world, it would be that dotted blue line there, Okay. But you can probably notice I've cut off the top of the graph. And that's because you have to start shrinking the graph really quite a lot to get towards the richest 1%. And there's a lot of talk about the 99% and the 1%. The reality is, is if your income is over £35,000 a year, you are in the top 1%. You are the 1% globally. 
So it's just an illustration of actually how unequal economic growth has been or uh, the, the world economy has been. And of course that causes all sorts of problems. You know, we have a lot of children, people dying unnecessarily around the world because of income inequality, because of the fact that they haven't got enough. And those are our problems of today, but we also have difficulties of tomorrow. Uh, Luther King said, you know, we have difficulties of today and tomorrow. And probably the most pressing, uh, obviously the frozen planet has been the most talked about story, most talked about, you know, um, TV program recently. And this was the ice cap in 1979, it's a NASA image, and uh, 2003 shrinking quite a lot. Um, I don't want to debate climate change now. I am not a PhD in climatology, uh, and probably not many in the room. There may be one or two, you never know. Um, but when you go to the States particularly, you get a lot of people who sort of deny that this is a problem, that basically this is. And I always think, well... Where has the peer-reviewed system in science broken down in this one instance? Because they all talk about the fact, oh, it's, you know, it's people wanting to get big grants, people wanting to do that and whatever. And the reality is that there's no, there's no economic incentives for all these scientists to be saying there's climate change, or very, very few, much more in the pharmaceutical industry and other places in our scientific research than there is in climate change. So I don't think there's any reason to believe that it's broken down in this way. And so there's obviously, it looms over our tomorrows, climate change and you know most of us who've got kids probably find that they talk about climate change how is it going to be in 50 years time in half a lifetime you know I'm coming up to my late 40s now I've probably gone over half a lifetime but you know half a life human lifetime ahead you know how many degrees of climate change are we going to have I've actually just put in planning permission for um, renovating my house and I, I live near a river and the River Authority now give you a one in a hundred year flood with four degrees of climate change built into their models. And that's just what they're giving a standard planning authority now. So it's quite um, interesting. London apparently can engineer itself out of a five metre sea level rise, but not a six or seven. What do we do if we do those things? These are big problems. Is this our future? An image from the road... Uh, I, if any of you have seen the road, I actually, I actually watched it on DVD and I had to keep pausing it. I found it so distressing to watch. Um, but I did make myself watch it all. I'd read the book before. But, um, you know, everything is dead. Everything is desolate. And if you think about most of our cinema images about the future, they are very apocalyptic. They were very, I know that is drama and we've had it actually since the Bible uh, was written. And we've always talked about, you know, uh, the fact that there's going to be an apocaly apocalypse. And so it's quite built into our psyches. But there's very, very few uh, images of the future which are vaguely utopian. I think the, the most one that probably comes close to it is the Star Trek films, where they're actually talking, you know, where there's actually sort of multicultural people all moving out into space and da da da. It's a bit optimistic. But most films about the future are not at all optimistic. But of course, there are other options. You know, can we have a future which is more sustainable, which is more community based? where we're more in touch with nature, where we respect older people, where we have more time to play. It's, can we create a future like this? Do we, do we, do we, can we do that? And ultimately, you know, which way are we going to go? It feels like we're at a particular turning point in history at the moment. Are we going to go to hell? Or are we going to go to utopia? I don't know whether there really are places in the States called hell and utopia, but I did find these on the web. And it, you know, it sounds, you know, you know which, which way are we going to turn? And it feels like there's lots of uh, you know, there's, there's lots of poignancy about this moment in time that we're living through. Um, and of course, it's not as simple as going right or left. Um, it's actually quite complex. Um, I don't know if you've heard of wicked problems. It's a phrase that has been used for quite a long time in systems science. Wicked problems are systematic. They're not mechanistic. They are not linear. Often people seem to look for simple linear solutions that, oh, if we do this, this will happen. The problem is that often with wicked problems, and the, the, the phrase here is used wicked not as in evil, not as in cool, um, but wicked as in not tame. Complex, interconnected, systemic issues. And um, they don't lend themselves to easy solutions. Um, and this is a real diagram from the government office uh, foresight on obesity. And it's basically trying to map all the issues on obesity. And as you can see, it's quite complex. This map actually won awards. 
Um, and there's for good reason, actually. There's a lot of good science behind it and identifying what the things are. But that's just about how much weight we've got around our waist. And, of course, that's something I suffer from quite a lot. But, um, but basically, you know, there's a lot, a lot of factors in there. So when the recent minister says um, we just eat too many calories, at one level he is correct, and it is very simple like that. And another, there's a lot of drivers around that that are very, very complex. This is one of the people who is one of my gurus, if you like, um, He's called Stafford Beer. He's, he's, he's sadly passed away. I never met him. I think Jeff Mulgan, actually, who's, a, who's a, a direct, uh, on the board of Action for Happiness and one of the founders, met him. But he's a great systems thinker. And uh, he wrote fantastic books like Designing Freedom, The Brain of the Firm, and Platform, Platforms for Change. He was a very radical man. He was an advisor to Alande in Chile when uh, Alande was obviously the, the prime minister, uh, the president of Chile, who was thrown out by the coup that Pinochet did. Uh, he was a very radical thinker, and he would draw diagrams. This is a diagram of the brain of a firm. Uh, and um, his thinking around how we make decisions and how we control complex systems uh, have been uh, very informative uh, in my work, really. Um, he's also got a very fine beard. Um, yeah. This is another man with a beard, uh, Manfred Max Neef. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He's, he's a Chilean, um, commonly called the barefoot economist. Uh, Manfred was um, a CEO of Shell uh, Chile uh, when he was about age 29, 30. And he played the piano very well. And he was playing the piano and drinking some brandy. And uh, he suddenly had this feeling that he could be drinking brandy and listening to classical music when he's 60 and have lived this life of an oil executive and, you know, had a very fine life. And he thought, nah, I want to do something more than that. And he quit and he basically went to become uh, an economist at Stanford. He got thrown out of Chile. But he basically became an economist for the poor of Latin America. From the outside looking in was his classic book, but he's written many more, including one just last year. Finally, he wrote another book called Economics Unmasked. He's actually a very radical economist. Um, and he taught me a lot about thinking about human needs and actually trying to think. He did this fantastic exercise, which he called on the pruning of language, which basically he took himself away with some other people and said, we will not use any of the classical economic terms to try and describe the situation in economics. And we must be able to describe them without words of economics. And he ended up coming to the fact that actually we have basic or fundamental human needs and how do we satisfy them. His work is still quite influential, particularly in Five Ways to Wellbeing uh, and other work. Um, and in fact, his was the talk that changed my life. And in fact, probably only 100 metres from here on Portland Place, I, I went to talk with him in 1990. Uh, and, um, and I quit my job the next week as it happens. <laughs> This is where I've ended up, the New Economics Foundation. Um, this is a, a picture of our building. We're a think tank um, in, in Vauxhall, uh, we're independent. Uh, we founded in 1986. And we have three principles that guide our work, which are sustainable development, social justice, and people's well-being. And um, you know, for my sins, I founded the work on well-being there just over a decade ago. Um, and it's sort of been added to the other two over the years, really. And we have a belief that having the right metrics, having the right numbers, is a, I wouldn't say it's the fundamental way of driving change at all, but it is a valid way of thinking about how to drive, drive uh, change. Uh, you know, what we, um, uh, Gus O'Donnell, who's the, um, the ex now permanent secretary, said what we treasure, uh, uh, measure what you treasure. Uh, was his phrase. People say measure what matters, all sorts of things. But basically, what we measure tends to be what we end up managing and what we tend to think about it. So it's good to create measures around stuff. Um, and um, New Economics Foundation are doing a lot of work in this area. There's a whole initiative called the Great Transition, which is basically if we imagine a future you know, where we've got um, lots of well-being, we're sustainable, we've got a fair distribution of wealth, you know, how do we need to get there? Well, we need new economic theory, basically, <laughs> because the old economic theory won't do it, and we need policy tools and we need a model. So like Stafford Beer drew very complex models, there are people working in NEF today, and I'm really glad they're doing this, and I'm quite glad I'm not, drawing models like this, and you know, huge equations, and uh, thinking about the labour market, and all sorts of ways, and all the interconnections between them. 
Um, so that sort of work is going on at NEF, but it's obviously not the only work we do. And, um, and I want to talk about is that, is that there's another way of thinking about it too. I think complexity is really good and we really do need to model it. But we also sometimes, I think we need to, um, as Stafford Beer would say, think before we think. And um, what you can see here is the NEF logo, and it has three circles. Well, the three circles in our logo stand for people, planet, and the economy. Quite three standard things to think about. But quite interestingly, um, you know, I was playing around with these symbols, and if you think about them, the orthodox economy thinks about these three areas as well, except they call them labor and materials. That basically the, what economics teaches you in, in, in university and school, whatever, is that you know, have an input of labor and materials and also actually uh, economic capital. And out of that, you will generate economic activity. So they're sucking them both in there. And um, if we want to think about well-being instead of just labor, we need to start thinking in a different way, which is that the economy should not be about sucking well-being in, but it should be about producing well-being that actually we should be thinking around how to, what's the quality of our economic system. It can't just be measured on its own terms. Economics has got away with, for 100 years of defining its success in its own terms. It has somehow convinced us all that uh, having a huge GDP is success. And it's not to say that that's not necessarily... Um, better than having a tiny GDP, but it's using its own way to understand it. You actually need to go to a different... If you want to really understand the quality of something, you need to have an outside metric, an outway, outside way of thinking about its value and its worth. And I think that's what well-being offers us. And, um, um, and this is the problem, is that basically economics has collapsed the idea of well-being into its own self. So when you come to an issue as complex and interconnected as sustainability, you have a real problem. Because if GDP is a proxy, is basically the measure of whether lives are going well, we've got a real problem. Because this is a graph of, along the bottom, ecological footprint, which is a measure of sustainability. Basically, more is not good for the planet. And um, does this work? Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, that's good. Um, the calculations are that it, roughly, if we had a sustainable planet, we should be scoring about 2, 2.1 on this indicator of ecological footprint. It's basically measuring, footprint is the analogy, it's measuring the pressure that we put on the planet. There is a surface area planet, it's got a certain biocapacity, there's a certain number of people on the planet, how much biocapacity do we have per person, and different countries around the world have different, put different pressures on the planet. And as you can see here, if this is GDP per capita, there pretty much there's a straight line through this, saying that, you know, the, basically the higher your GDP per capita is, the higher your ecological footprint is. And so it feels like if we're to, if we're to sort of, in our Copenhagen and our Rio and our Kyoto sort of uh, discussions, if we're actually to address sustainability and it feels like we're going to have to go down this line. How, how are we going to do that? Because basically it feels like we're going to have to give up good lives now to somehow for the future. And, and, and that's just not politically possible. I mean, how can any politician go to the polls and say you've got to give up quality of life now? In fact, you know, some of us and, um, you know, find it quite hard to give up smoking. Smoking is a short-term pleasure we know it's got a long-term cost. It's even us in the future. It's our future selves that are going to be damaged. And we find it a struggle. So this is actually saying other people, maybe in other countries, are as yet unborn, who are going to suffer, and I've got to give something up now. It's not an easy political problem to start dealing with that. So we need to start thinking about, actually, instead of thinking, giving economics, get, letting economics get away with thinking about its success in its own terms, we need to start thinking about a new measure, which is actually how our lives going. And we need to think about the relationship between how many resources we use and the way that lives of people are going. And that's precisely what we've done at the New Economics Foundation. Of course we have. Here's one we prepared earlier. Um, so the Happy Planet Index, which is basically the idea is how much well-being do we get for our resource use? 
And um, we say that you can measure well-being by how, you know, how are lives going in countries, how happy people are and how healthy they are, how long do they live, uh, and then how many resources do they use. It's a very simple idea, really. We now have surveys around the world that go around and ask people, and they ask people things... Um, Right, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they ask people how satisfied they are with their lives, which has tended to be taken to be happiness. We could discuss that if we wanted to. And uh, we can look at UN data on how long people live in countries, and we can bring those two together. And then we can divide it by their resource use, so basically creating a, a massive efficiency indicator. We're saying how much bang do you get for your buck, how many miles per gallon, how much well-being do you get for your resource use. And the reason why it goes approximately is that there's a little bit of, of statistical jiggery-pokery there, so that it's sort of, um, uh, which I can explain to you. But basically, you move from this graph, which is this is the one again of GDP as a proxy for good lives and ecological footprint here, to which there looks like no possibility, and you move to this graph. And suddenly you see nations of the world spread out and you start seeing them in a different way. So that, you know, the, the, the richer countries are up here and the very poor countries, sub-Saharan Africa are down here. They're not producing much well-being and they're poor. They're not using many environmental resources but they're not generating human well-being. So they're, they're not doing well in any way. Uh, you know, uh, the USA... Uh, Luxembourg's up there, a couple of um, uh, Arab states here which use very much uh, ecological footprint for their air conditioning, their 4 by 4s and things. And for their citizens, do quite well, but they've obviously got a lot of guest workers there who um, don't get included in the statistics in this way because they're not citizens. So there's all sorts of always issues with statistics. You've got Europe going across the top here, the UK is one of these up here. But then you've got this whole group of nations over here who are, some of them, uh, this is mainly uh, transition countries and Asian countries, are sort of doing okay, could do better. But then you see these yellow diamonds, which are doing really well. And they are Latin American countries, South American countries, where they are living more within the planet's resources. Not that they don't have problems, they definitely have problems but they're actually generating quite good lives on a lot less resource use than we are. And sat up there right on its own is Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica, um, average life expectancy is actually longer than in the USA. Uh, they actually come out as probably, the, I mean, it's always a bit debatable, these shows, but from the Gallup World Poll, they came out as the happiest country on the planet, the happiest even happier than Denmark, who's normally considered to be the happiest. And, um, and they do that on a quarter to a fifth of the resource use that the USA do, about a third of ours. So, you know, when we think about the future, you know, maybe we have to think actually out of the box here and think, you know, is it Chinese or is it Latin America? Uh, you know, these are interesting things. And actually, the big challenge that we face, this is just putting it into another package, same graph, where yellow is the global average, is if we're going to create a happier world and we want it to be sustainable, it doesn't seem to me to be logical to create a happier world if it's going to fall over in 40, 50 years' time. So we've got to make it sustainable. Then actually what we're trying to do is we're trying to move this global average up there. And to do that, we've got to move all the nations of the world, hopefully it's going to move, yeah. um, somewhere up there. And the point with that really is that it's not one intervention fits all. There's very, very different things that need to happen in sub-Saharan Africa to move up there than there are from UK, USA, other Western countries to move this way. Very, very different sets of intervention. But basically, that's the challenge that we face. And uh, that's quite a big ask. <laughs> and I think that's sometimes why it becomes depressing, is thinking, how do we change these systems in this way? How do we really, really do that? And, you know, is it all hopeless? Um, you know, what can little me do about this? And, you know, can we together make a difference? And, um, oh. <laughs> you messed up my graph, Mark. There's Tina Turner. <laughs> you weren't supposed to get Action for Happiness yet, but um, just pretend you can't see Action for Happiness there. Um, 
who said, obviously, what's love got to do with it? But what has happiness got to do with this? What has happiness? I don't know if anyone can sing what's love got to do with it. But, uh, but, uh, but anyway, um, what has happiness got to do with it? You know, surely it's a question of other things. And basically what I want to suggest is that actually we are very emotional beings. Uh, that's part of our, you, you know, part of our whole being as being human beings is our emotions and they have evolved for certain reasons. And um, this is a classic picture from psychology, psychological research, of what are sometimes considered the primary emotions, a bit like primary colours, you know, that what are the main emotions. And um, uh, here, what's she, what, what, well, what's he doing? Hmm? Yeah, well, I think this is fear. He's surprised. I think. <laughs> she... Anger, yeah. Yeah, disgust. Sadness. Happiness, yeah. With a, with a nice little gap in his tooth, I think. Yeah. Um, and these were uh, part of a classic experiment by um, Aikman, I think his name is. Um, and he basically went around lots of different cultures in the world and everybody could name those emotions, whichever culture you're in. They're basically universal and um, so they, have, they are something about human beings. They've evolved for a reason. And um, uh, I actually haven't put surprise in here, but um, uh, it's, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know with surprise and disgust. In some ways, they don't feel quite like emotions to me. But anyway, that's how they're classified. But the thing is that they, they are basically evoked by the environment around us, um, uh, and typical situations that generate fear are a source of danger. Uh, anger is about a violation of a norm. Someone has, you know, um, basically overstepped a mark for us, uh, whether it's a social norm or a private thing that we feel. Sadness is about a loss of support. And disgust, disgust is about contamination or perceived contamination. And what they do in the organism is that they immediately evoke Reactions in the organism which can make action. Sometimes quicker, we're not in control of them, you know. Anger can suddenly overtake us, you know. Hormones pump around us and da-da-da and we, we immediately start to act. Or fear, you know, immediately we go wide-eyed and, and, uh, and, you know. So fear is around detecting, is it a real danger? Running away. Uh, sometimes can be very still so that we don't get noticed, you know, like a... Uh, dear, or we, we crowd together. Um, there are gender differences with how we respond to fear. Men tend to take more individual action. Women tend to group together and find collective solutions. Women are better at finding collective solutions than men generally. Um, violation of a norm. You, you take actions to deter future violations. Sadness. I've always found this one quite interesting. But you're basically saving energy and you're sort of treading carefully until conditions improve. Um, and uh, disgust is spit out of void, whatever. But, um, but uh, they, all of these things can be very functional for us. Thank you very much. You know, if we're frightened of something that's a real danger, we do need to detect it and go away. And uh, sometimes it's very appropriate to be angry and to be sad. These can also get stuck. Um, we all know people that anger far too quickly, that, um, that are hyper-anxious, uh, panic attacks. Uh, depression is a very rigid form of sadness, where basically the organism is shut down into a very low energy state, but has actually lost the sensitivity to notice that conditions may be improved or that there may be support out there. And um, so they, they can become dysfunctional, but when they're functional, they are entirely appropriate things for us to feel and do. But what about positive emotions? What about happiness? What's their evolutionary purpose? Um, and this woman who's called Barbara Fredrickson, who it would be a delight if we could one day get to London to give an action of happiness. And, our, and I know Barbara a bit, and we'll try and work on getting her here. I think has the, the best theory for me coming out of positive psychology, which is about the evolutionary role of emotions. And what she says and shows in her experiment, she's a lab uh, a psychologist. She basically puts people in different moods. <laughs> a classic thing that she does is she'll show you a video of a baby crying and being left alone. 
that makes you feel a little bit anxious pretty quickly. And then she'll show the other group a gurgling baby who's quite happy, which makes them feel quite happy. And she will give them tasks and see how they perform them. And what she's been able to show is, is, you know, in the summary of all her work, which you know, she could talk about for hours here, is that basically positive emotions broaden our thoughts and our actions when we are frightened or angry, particularly angry, we narrow down and we see things very, very... We lose peripheral vision and all sorts of things. Whereas when we are in a good mood, we see the whole spectrum of things. We see the bigger picture when we're in a good mood. We are more open to relationships. We're more playful. I doubt many of you met what the Americans so nicely call your romantic partner. I doubt many of you met them when they were angry or frightened Okay, you probably met them when they were happy or you were happy. And you were able, so you basically, you know, you'll, a smile. A smile is you can approach me, you can talk to me. People who smile more create more opportunities for themselves because they are approachable. And not only does it broaden our responses, but it builds our resources for the future that basically this is where our self-confidence, our self-esteem, our resilience come from, is our experiences. And uh, when we have good experiences and we, you know, we play and we basically build relationships, we're building up ourselves and our own resources. So she calls it the broaden and build theory of positive uh, emotions. And effectively what this means is that happiness matters. And it's more about opportunities than it is about threats. And that it can help us build better futures. It is functional. Not only is it a desirable outcome, but happiness and well-being is functional about how we will respond to future challenges. Um, so, it's good. But what about drawing? <laughs> and Mark forgot to say this to you but you have a bit of paper and a pen in front of you. Everybody has a bit of paper and pen in front of you. And what we're going to do now, rather than just let you sit and talk to me, and there's a bit of a break, is we're going to draw something. But and I'm going to make a game for you, which you uh, may or may not like. <laughs> but what I would like you to do is to take the pen and pencil, and I would like you to find a partner, and you're going to draw each other. And all of you are now thinking, I can't draw, I can't draw. But there's a trick to this, okay? As you draw them, you may not look at the piece of paper. You may not look at the piece of paper. Okay? And I want you to find a partner, and I'm going to give you one minute, and one minute only, to draw each other. And that starts now. And can you give it to your partner as a memento of today? So can you sign it and give it to them? <coughs> uh, if I can just comment there, there was quite an explosion of energy in the room there. And that was positive emotions. There was so much laughter, yeah? And, uh, and um, you know, basically you've done a, a, it's a trick, obviously, but you, you've actually probably nearly had, uh, a lot of you have nearly had a minute's eye contact with the person next to you as you looked into it. That's a, uh, that's a very rare experience. You don't normally do that to a stranger. Or, you know, you do that if you're in love, but <laughs> not much more than that. And in fact, Barbara Federson's next book will be on love. She rather romantically calls it positivity resonance, but it's about love. <laughs> uh, but you had a lot of positivity resonance going on there, where your positivity 
goes to the next person, goes to the next person, it's very, very contagious. In fact, there are neuroscientists that talk about the neurons in your brain, that basically your empathy neurons that basically get fired by this. Basically, happiness is very, very contagious, okay? And all those emotions started to go there. And not only that, not only did you have eye contact and a lot of laughter and emotions, okay? You did some other things, okay? And one of those things you did was you connected with the person next to you, which is that basically you, you made a connection with them. This is a bit stretching it, but you were slightly active. You basically started to do something. And uh, you would have had to have done this. You would have had to have taken notice of basically the person around you and their features. You may not have got that onto the paper very well. <laughs> but you were drawing things you thought you were seeing. And probably a lot of you probably looked a bit like Picasso, your offerings, I imagine. <laughs> Noses out of place and all sorts of things. Okay, you hopefully learned something. You probably learned that actually, you know, drawing can be amusing. Most of you groaned when I said you're going to draw each other at the beginning. But it was a funny experience. As long as we look, drop the idea that we have to be perfect about what we're doing, it can be quite amusing. And then finally, you gave it to each other as a gift. Okay? Now, coincidentally, very coincidentally, they are what we call the five ways to well-being at New Economics Foundation. That actually the things that people do that generate the most positivity, well-being, happiness in them are these five things. Connecting. Our social relationships are the most important thing for our well-being and happiness. Being active. Okay, I didn't get you to stretch and to move, but actually if you're feeling grumpy, if you're feeling down, if you're in a bad mood, the fastest way out of it is not to reach for a glass of white wine, though sometimes that can help, not to reach for the chocolate, but actually the most best way is probably to go out for a walk, uh, a run if that's what does you. I'm not a creature of speed myself, but some people do like to run. Uh, is, uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, whatever it is, bicycle, but actually getting out. And in fact, if you know someone that is, is depressed and down, if you can get them to just step outside go for a walk, that is actually one of the most therapeutic things they can do. Definitely clinically proved to be better than medication and things like that. If, I know it's very, very hard to get them up off the sofa, out of bed, and that sort of situation, but if you can, it's really, really good. Taking notice is about being engaged in the world. You know, taking time sometimes to sort of stop and notice something beautiful. Uh, mindfulness, cognitive behavioural therapy, lots of stuff on this. There's lots of people talking about mindfulness as a thing. Sometimes I... I think it's a bit of a stretch to think we're getting everyone being mindful, but notice that the most popular participant of sport is fishing, which is probably meditation by the back door a lot of the time. You know, uh, might be escaping the wife sometimes, but, but basically people do find ways to be still. You know, they want to walk by water or something. So we find ways to do that. Keeping learning, you know, definitely if you can keep learning throughout the whole life course, that's why the word keep is in there. It's actually really, really good for us. And brain elasticity continues right into your 80s, 90s. It doesn't... You can keep learning. And then giving. Giving is, you know, paradoxically in some ways, it's good for our well-being as well as the other person. Of course, this is evolution, again, playing its magic, that, you know, we need our groups to survive. So actually we feel good when we give because it helps the whole group survive, the whole group thrive. And we feel good too. The trick is you can't give to feel good, you know, uh, it actually has to be genuine, <laughs> uh, but, you know, giving is really, really good, and, you know, and the whole of, you know, the, the whole thrust and the reason, you know, that Richard Layard and others set up Action for Happiness, I think is particularly around this last point around giving, that actually how do we become a more generous society, in lots of ways giving is the most fundamentally anti-economic activity we can do, is when we're giving stuff away rather than trying to sell it or trying to buy it. It's actually, it's threatening to the economy in some ways, which is good in my opinion. But basically, and if you look at those five things, you know, it's interesting. We think about the, the things I was talking about, sustainability, is there's not really that much material content to them. We obviously do obviously need comfort and physical survival things, but actually we could lead very good lives that didn't involve all sorts of things that we have now that uh, are polluting and all sorts of things. And it just opens up a possibility space that actually we probably could have a much happier future with, with, with less pressures and stuff around us. At least the possibility of it. 
And the five ways have actually been, they were designed actually for the Government Office of Foresight. Um, when we, when we, we won the project, we were basically asked to come up with what would be the well-being equivalent of five fruit and vegetables a day. And that's why there are five of them. <laughs> uh, it is a social marketing exercise. It's basically trying to uh, condense the evidence on well-being. There's lots of other things that are important. It's not only about our individual actions, our environments, uh, uh, the conditions of life are hugely, hugely important to us. But basically, there are individual things that we can do ourselves to be, um, to be happier and have higher levels of well-being and encourage our children to, our friends, our neighbours to, and whatever. And they came out as these postcards, uh, which you can still go to the next website and buy, but basically... Um, they were just a way of communicating it. Um, now, they've been used in lots and lots of different ways. They were de designed for individual action, and someone um, who you may have heard of actually picked them up and used them quite quickly, which is Action for Happiness, in their 10 Keys to Happier Living, which are broader than just the five ways, which are individual actions. But if you look at the five left ones, they make this thing about great dream, that the five left ones are giving, relating, exercising, appreciating, trying out. They are the five ways rewritten to make great. And then they're broadened out to other things around meaning and purpose, um, uh, direction, resilience, emotion, acceptance, other more psychological functional things. So they've been used there. Um, and um, they've been used in a project in, called Well London, which has got a whole series of stuff called Do It Yourself Happiness, which is unusual in the positive psychology field because it's actually reaching out to very poor communities uh, they've been used in Liverpool as a way of framing the whole health and well-being uh, strategy. They've been used by mind in quite a lot of places. Uh, they've been translated into other languages. This is uh, New Zealand, and they're in Maori at the bottom. Uh, I saw someone on someone's desk in Chinese the other week. Yeah? So someone in China has done them. They've definitely been in Norway. Um, and uh, in Norway, it's quite interesting. They did them, and under be active was have sex. But, I mean, that's Scandinavian <laughs> for you, you know. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, um, and, uh, and then this one I like, a schools project in Stockport uh, did uh, Whitwolf's Journey to Happiness. And uh, all the kids drew and did stories and Whitwolf learns that if he's be active, you know, he can dance and uh, he can, uh, him, and, him and Red Riding Hood can make, do each other's hair. And, you know, um, so basically they sort of live happily ever after. And... and um, and so much, and if you think about this, NEF is a small think tank. We don't have money to push this stuff. You know, we don't have budgets to do a social marketing campaign. We did this work for the government of science. But we did have a project just recently which basically framed together all the ways that the five ways, all the ones we've heard of, have been used in the UK. And there are children's services that have done stuff, Adam, so, uh, social care, planning, transport services, da, da, da. and we basically categorised them by the different ones they've done. And these were all people that had deliberately used the five ways in framing the way that they were deliver delivering their services. And I think when you've done an idea where you've got nothing to push it and people pick up with it, you've basically made something contagious and viral in a way. And the five ways have done that slightly. And there's a whole report that you can download from my website which basically gives examples of the ways that the five ways have been used. There's also the original report about the theory behind them and all the stuff as well. Um, but, as Mark said earlier, there's actually not just about what we can do, it's about what governments can do. And most of you would have heard that the Office of National Statistics and David Cameron have started to talk about measuring national well-being. Um, there's been a sort of debate, I wouldn't say it was really a debate, but there's been some consultation, shall we say, by the Office of National Statistics on how it should be measured. You know, uh, we've had things like, you know, uh, headlines that, you know, this was when it was announced that uh, they were going to measure a happiness uh, index. And interestingly, this was, this was uh, just over a year ago, and I think we just recently, six months before, just set it as a five-year plan that the Welsh Assembly would make a national indicator of well-being. And then six months later, Cameron announces that the whole of the UK will do. So that's how fast the agenda's moving, faster than even we expected. And he says things like, you know, we have to recognise officially that economic growth is a means to an end, which is basically what I was saying earlier. He looks a little bit younger and thinner and less grey there, doesn't he? Um, anyway... Um, and, of course, this is actually this week, this has rather been challenged. Uh, there's a group called the uh, Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, which you can guess their political leaning just by their very title, which says that government shouldn't worry about our happiness. New research shows that this is true. 
And, uh, and, you know, interestingly, they put a whole bunch of papers together, and some of which are very interesting and certainly are not things that we would disagree with. Uh, but it's interesting how they, they put it out into the media that basically this meant the government shouldn't have to think about happiness and well-being altogether. They did lots and lots of points, which I won't go through, but you can look at. But, you know, some of my favourites are, you know, that uh, uh, there's no evidence that more equal societies leads to increases in happiness. I mean, there's not a political agenda behind there, is there? We actually, you know, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, it's, you know, in some ways, that is what the data shows, but it does show that it leads to massive health inequalities, for example. So if we take the metric that it's happy and long lives, it definitely falls to that. And it might be that we just don't like inequality for its own sake, and we actually just think it's wrong. Uh, you know, possible as that. Um, there's something called the Easterlin Paradox, which is quite a complex thing, but they said this new evidence shown it to be a fake I mean, that's fairly confident. You know, a fake insinuates that somehow that's actually been a deception on the part of Richard Easterlin, who actually came out with it in 1973. And uh, actually, there's a lot of, lot of work behind it. And all the new evidence shows that maybe at this sort of second decimal place, there might be a problem with it. Uh, attempts to promote well-being at work are likely to be counterproductive. And da -da -da -da. But they basically talk about well-being at work through regulation, basically saying that somehow government's going to tell you you should be happier at work, which would be probably the most inefficient way of doing it. And then this one is smaller governments tend to make people happier. Public spending cuts will actually be the key to making Britain a happier place. <laughs> I mean, it's just extraordinary. And um, as I understand it, they're having a debate next week, aren't they? Next Wednesday, yeah? Uh, you can look up on their website. So I think it'd be quite funny if people flash mobbed it and actually gave them a bit of jip. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, but it is interesting, an interesting thing. And of course, actually, this is a sign of success is if actually people like this feel they have to make a report against it, it's actually showing that it's scared them and that actually it's starting to get some serious traction. And so what can governments do? I'm going to basically dismiss this thing that basically governments should do nothing about happiness and well-being. Well, broadly, there are three areas that, the, that, that government... This is a real gross simplification. But basically, governments do act in these areas of the economy, of public services and of local areas... Okay? Broadly, they impact these areas. So um, these are some uh, strategies that you could think about okay, in these areas. And this is, these are just starter for 10 strategies. But basically, you know, creating good work. So actually, that would be good. You know, thinking about the number of hours that we work, actually creating meaningful jobs for people. Uh, uh, unemployment is dreadful for uh, people's well-being. So you know, perhaps we should have more people part-time and, you know, share out the, 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 the economic tensions of our times, creating good work. I'm going to come back to that. Reform the banking system is actually, in my opinion, a happiness agenda. Uh, you know, uh, financial exclusion uh, actually, you know, really stifles people's lives. Uh, the interest rates that people, uh, you know, on, uh, who've got less money have to pay you know, 200% a year, all this sort of stuff. Basically, they're excluded from ever getting out of their situations. The way that the banking system creates money, the way that it keeps money for the bankers, uh, the way it doesn't redistribute it is, is, is a dreadful thing. Lots and lots of stuff, and people know much more about that uh, than me uh, at NEF. But basically, that is a happiness intervention. Um, public services, we can think about schools, about promoting complete health. Uh, and then locally, we can think about how you engage with citizens. And then I think building good foundations, actually planning laws, the way that we actually build, our, build new build communities. So we don't use little boxes with fences uh, and no community buildings, no community space. The car is king. We're actually not building an environment that's good for kids and for people to, to grow up in. And then the seventh one, I would say this, I'm a statistician, but it's great good measures of well-being uh, and things like that. And all of those seven things are fleshed out more. It's a bit of self-promotion in the book that I wrote for Ted, uh, which I'm afraid is download only, um, which is a dreadful thing, but that's what it is. So that's what I was commissioned to do. And it was short, that's why I did it. It was only 20,000 words. I thought I could do that. I, I'm not very good at writing. Um, anyway, I want to just talk briefly and to end, really, about this last one about creating good work because it's basically what I'm doing with my time at the moment and what I'm going to do more of over the next year is I think this is a very interesting way. It's quite hard to reach adult populations around happiness. And what most of it is, you know, children, the school systems, older people tend to be accessing services more. But actually, the main, main, main body of the population 
the main way you can sort of reach them and touch their lives is through work. And um, so what we're doing is thinking about happiness at work. And we've got some partners from the US called um, Delivering Happiness at Work. And uh, we're starting to think about how we can intervene in this space and actually make better jobs for people. Um, and um, this is a book that came out um, last year, the year before, and it was called Delivering Happiness, which I thought was the most ridiculous idea because you obviously cannot deliver happiness. You can deliver pizzas, you can deliver packages, but I cannot, you know, give you happiness. Yeah? I can try, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's between us. It's produced between us. It's co-produced. So when I first saw the book out there, I thought this was going to be terrible and rubbish and, and da 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 and then someone told me it was actually quite a good read and I'm very glad I did read it because it's written by a guy called Tony Shea and Tony Shea is um, CEO of a firm called Zappos which probably most people in this room have not heard of because we're not American um, but uh, Zappos is the Amazon equivalent of shoes uh, basically it's an online shoes and clothing company uh, and uh, it's quite big and um, Tony's sort of this extraordinary character. He's in his mid-30s. And he, he made, uh, he, he, when he was at university, he set up a company which was called Link Exchange, which basically was the person who designed the first click-through adverts and on the internet. And him and some friends sold that to Microsoft for $230 million after four years. And um, he then, but he, he, he was given what's called a you know, golden handcuffs agreement, which was he had to stay at Microsoft for three years. And after three months, he walked out because he hated his job and lost 15 or $20 million because he wouldn't stay the three years. And he vowed that he would never do a job he didn't enjoy anymore. And he then decided he'd become a venture capitalist. And of course, he proceeded to lose money because just because he'd done, built one company didn't mean to say he could spot the next thing. But he did. And he spotted this idea that basically Zappos' idea of selling shoes on the internet would work. And it's now a billion-dollar business. It turns over $15 million a day. And it's one of the 10 best places to work because happiness is their business model. And basically, his idea is that if you make your employees happy, great things happen. If you dare to do that. And he's extraordinary because you know, here he is, CEO of the company. He just sits in a booth on the open plan thing. He has no sort of airs and graces about him. And if you ask him about something, he goes, I'm not the decision maker on that. And he just delegates, delegates, delegates. And it's very, very interesting. And Zappos is quite a zany place to work. I'm not saying that it would work in a lot of companies. There's a lot of high-fiving awesomeness around it. <laughs> um, but uh, you can go, you can look at videos online, and they are all dressed up. And I have been to the headquarters, which are, of course, in Las Vegas, of all places. Uh, but, um, but they are doing a lot of work while they're having a good time. And they're basically a big call center, you know, which is not the most exciting work. And they're actually making it so that people are much more committed. You know, that's, a, that's a business which has got very high turnover of staff. They don't, you know, and all sorts of other things. So there's huge business savings to them. And they're also a very efficient place. In fact, they were bought by Amazon about a year and a half ago. And um, I can't remember, what, what's the name of the director of Amazon? What's it? Yeah, he said, they said to him, did you buy them because it was a happy place to work? And he said, no, warehouse efficiency. So, <laughs> so... They are efficient and they're happy. Okay? And we're doing this. And basically, this is our research, which is that in the UK, because I'm actually running out of time, in the UK, 50% of staff employees in the UK have done a survey. Okay? We're statisticians. We can do surveys. So 50% of employees have done a survey. But unfortunately, 80% of them thought they made absolutely no impact on their working lives at all. And so people are being surveyed, they're being asked questions in businesses, but they're not actually leading to any different changes. And so what you want to do is change that. And so we've designed, um, oh no, I've got something here. This is basically to convince you that happiness at work is important, um, which is that the value of companies in the 1950s was mainly the tangibles, actually the stock and the buildings and everything like that. And what's happened by now is that most of the valuation on the stock market of businesses is the intangibles. Uh, which, of course, includes the people in the system. And, uh, but they're not like other assets because you don't... Uh, there's this phrase, human capital, but you don't own your people, you rent them. 
uh, it's a rental agreement, you know, a monthly rental agreement or six monthly rental agreement. So you can't sweat your assets, as the Americans would say. It is about working with people. Um, and I've got some more slides, but I'm going to go through them because they are about systems theory, and I don't really want to do that now. But um, we've done this thing, which is basically um, a survey, and here's a picture of it, basically very nice and da-da-da, and the gentleman over there, Rich, is the software designer, uh, and done a really good job at it. And uh, it's very, very simple. You, you go online, you answer these questions, and then it gives you results in a very, very easy-to-understand way. You know, this is about... People at work, it's about uh, their jobs, the teams, the organization, and the social impact the business makes. And the idea of all these indicators is that they all run from 0 to 10, where 0 is very bad and 10 is very good, and 5 is national average, it's the benchmark. And the reason for having a benchmark is everyone wants to know how they're doing compared to everybody else. So if you know you've got a score above five, you know you're doing better than other people and you can get traffic light systems. And the idea about it is that we start to facilitate uh, conversations in teams because, in, you know, I, I worked uh, before I was at NEF. One of my trains I did was as a psychotherapist. And all a psychotherapist does really, I mean, apart from you paying and talking to them about your problems, is that they listen to you and then they reflect back what they're hearing and then sometimes they ask some challenging questions. And that's the therapeutic process. The process is really to help people see themselves and to start conversations around how they can change. And this is just at a group level, this. It's listening to the organization, the teams. It's reflecting back to them, the scores. And then it's helping them have conversations. Because a lot of well-being at work, of happiness at work, is in your teams, and that's where things can happen. Some things are organizational issues as well, but basically it's actually how do you frame a conversation around it. So just like in communities, if you start to have a conversation around how your well-being of your community is, you've actually started the change process already by having the conversation, and that's what this tool is designed to do. So it'll be launching very soon. It'll be free to people, uh, free to us, free to people, uh, for up to five users. It, there'll be master classes that we're running and blah, blah. I'm supposed to sell these consultancy things. We're going to offer leadership programs. And the thing to say is it is about making some money for NEF, but all uh, NEF Consulting is wholly owned by the charity NEF, and basically we're just going to use it to cross-fund our other work, and it's launching very soon. So we do face difficulties. The difficulties are serious. Uh, and they're local, they're global, they're, uh, you know, they are serious, serious issues. But a health warning, being happy can be seriously good for you. It can be good for you, your health, and your community, and probably the planet too. And happiness is a serious matter, and it is actually what we should be trying to promote in the world. Thank you very much.